Gig Gab, episode 383 for Monday, May 15th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor for this episode is Super Mega Ultra Groovy at capoapp.com. This will give you song learning superpowers, I promise. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. For now, here in uh, a uh, sweaty rehearsal room where Fling just finished rehearsing in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in my mother-in-law's spare bedroom in Sunnyvale, California, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we are. I am in my normal spot. It just doesn't smell like my normal spot because uh, <laughs> we just finished fling rehearsal. <laughs> I'd rather be here then. Uh, yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, I just had to light a candle because uh, I don't like it's. Yeah, it smells like man in here is what it does. But you know, man, it goes. <laughs> man sweat. <laughs> yeah, I um. It smelled like man sweat on stage on, on Friday night. We played Monkey Fist played, which Monkey Fist is uh, acoustic trio. It's um, two acoustic guitars and me playing, usually playing cajon or some other percussion. But I was playing the pitch slap on, on Friday night and uh, just playing, you know, cover tunes from a lot of 90s stuff. Johnny D who sings in that band is, is uh, he is a great singer of nineties material, but you know, stuff from all the decades and just having fun. It was, it was a perfect day. It was an outdoor gig at this place we played before called the dairy field where we overlook a, uh, a golf course. And, uh, but it's a public golf course. Like the people that come are like salt of the earth. It's a, it's always a great crowd. And it was like 85 degrees or something that day, which is, you know, kind of one of our first 85 degree days here this year. And, uh, it was such a party there that between songs on stage, I just noticed like we couldn't really hear the monitors as well as we would like. And we're turning things up more than we would normally. And I looked at my Apple watch, which has a pretty decent, um, you know, SPL meter on it. And it was showing almost 90 DB just when we weren't playing just the oh. crowd. Yeah. And it was like, okay, <laughs> like this is, I should have, I should have set up in ears, like all, like all of the should have, would have, could have uh, kind of went through my head, but it was like, all right, well, it's just going to be one of those nights. And, um, it was a great gig, like, but it was, you know, that's loud, man. Like I've most monkey fist gigs. It's never 90 DB on stage. Like when we're playing and this was, we had to get above 90 is what we had to do, uh, wow. which is, which is a lot. Yeah. Well above actually. Right. What's that? Well yeah, above, yeah, maybe five, five dB up. Like I didn't go much higher than that. I mean, even ninety five dB is like that's really loud. But um, you know, we need to be able to hear what we were doing. <laughs> so yeah, it was loud in there. Yeah, but it was a fun gig. Like everybody played well, everybody sang well. Uh, the crowd was super into it, which obviously was good. If they were that loud and not into it, it would have been well, it would have been easy to pack it up and leave. I suppose. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But we did not. We uh, we we enjoyed it. It was a fun. It was really fun to get back out there. I don't think I had played at the Dairy Field since pre-COVID lockdowns. Uh, so you it's know, it's weird now to kind of conceptualize the amount of time that is, right? Right. I I, I hadn't thought years, about right? it until right now. Yeah, it was probably it was it was three years ago that I no, almost four years ago that I big played chunk there. of our performing life. Wow, gone. I'll have to look. Yeah. yeah. I got to look at my calendar, but that I don't think like we had a gig there in 2021. And like the day before our gig, there was a huge kerfuffle that like half the staff got COVID or whatever. So that one didn't happen. And then I don't think we wound up booking anything there last year. If they did, it was on a date where I had like a better pill gig or something and couldn't do it. And so yeah, but I, I, I'm well, pretty we, sure. We did 18 months to two years of shows talking about when's it going to be over, what's it mean mm -hmm. to the music. I mean, we talked about it every every single week for almost two years. And, you know, it's funny, I was seeing something the other day. Someone said, oh, you know, nobody's talking about COVID deaths anymore. 
because nobody's talking about COVID. It's not, it's not that it's not happening anymore. And I, sure. you know, I just came back from dinner and, you know, the staff was wearing masks and, you know, it, it's, it's a very weird place that we're in where it is, it is still ab- absolutely a part of life. I mean, it's still people getting sick, people dying, yeah. you know, people making decisions, uh, health decisions for themselves, people making social decisions about other people and what that means to them. I mean, it's still really part of culture. Um, but it just, it hasn't gone away yet. I mean, it, and it, I guess it's never going to go away. Is it? I guess, I don't think so. No, I think it's, I think we, we just, it's, like, it's, it's now, it's the new normal, another, it's the new flu, right? It's, but you know, yeah. but potentially often much worse in the same Maybe. way we live with annual flu season. Yeah. We live with constant, you know, COVID decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had, and everybody's different. I don't mean to. Do you ever just, wear a mask now? <laughs> um, I, only in the airport, not on a plane, like planes yeah. are fine, but um, I find it, it was funny. I had, I've had COVID twice, right? I had COVID uh, a year ago, January, January of 20, let's say 20, what, what's year is this? 22. I think so. I think that's right. I had COVID 22 or was it 21? I don't know. Whenever it was, I had it in January and then again in August. Um, it must, it might've been a year ago, but anyway. Uh, I had just finished having COVID in August. So like there was very little chance that I was going to get it right away again. Right. You know, I, I, I was confident of that whether I should have been or not is irrelevant, but I was confident yeah. there was no way that I was going to get COVID again. I had it at the beginning of August. I traveled uh, to Dallas at the end of August. So I was like, this is great. I don't need to wear a mask. You know, I'm, I'm good. And I got to the airport, Boston, Logan, to board my flight, you know, to get ready and board my flight for Dallas. And I just was watching all these people kind of like, you know, walking off their flights and they just looked like sweaty and gross. Cause everybody's gross when you get off an airplane. And I was like, man, like what, I'm not worried about them having COVID, but like, what about all the other things that they have? And I was like, all right, where's my mask? So I put my mask on <laughs> and, uh, and since then I've, I've pretty much for the same reason, it's, it's not so much like COVID specific. It's just like, this is a, a gross group of humans in a chaotic environment. Like there's, there's no order to an airport, right? Like when you're on a plane, it's very orderly, it, you know, when you're on a bus, whatever, everybody's in their spot and everything's fine. But, and even getting on the plane is relatively orderly, but in the terminal, it's not. And so, yeah, I, uh, I've, I've taken to often, not always, but I, I keep a mask, you know, I keep a couple masks with me in my travel bag or whatever. And if I feel the, the desire, I put one on in the, in the terminal, I usually take it off once I get yeah. on the plane, but yeah. So how about you? I think, um, I haven't put a mask on in a while. Don, our drummer in the house rockers has had a mask on fairly consistently all the way through. Okay. Know, you know, we're about to start to get busy. I don't know where, you know, like he should do him. And, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Right. Yeah. So um, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. It, 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 but you're right. Fascinating we, is one way to look at it. But we talked about COVID every episode for well over a year, and now how many episodes has it been before it? You know, yeah. and now it only came up sort of like a, you know, almost accidentally. Right. It certainly wasn't on the right. agenda. So. Yep. In fact, it was specifically not on the agenda, but that's, yeah, that's exactly. a different story. Yeah. <laughs> that's COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had a, an interesting gig last weekend. So I want to tell you about um, a guy who I'm playing with down in, in my hometown, not the town I live in now. Right. So yep. I moved down there and I started doing solo gigs and then kind of thought that, you know, it might be fun to play with someone. And I knew, I knew a drummer. I I didn't know him very well but he was from the Bay area as well. And he, I knew he was down there. Yep. And when he heard I was going to move down, he reached out and said, Hey, you know, connect with me when you get down. And then I, I just happened to do a, a Craigslist scan one day and there was a bass player who said all the right things. And so the three of us got together and we've been playing for a while, Yeah. you know, once yeah, or twice you, a month. You've talked about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So about ugh, maybe about a year ago, a guy I went to high school with many, many years ago posted something on Facebook saying he's moving down to the area where I live. And uh, I don't even think we were connected by Facebook. I think I saw it through someone else. Or oh, wow. Someone might have said, hey. Anyway, 
I reached out, said, hey, I'm down here. If there's anything I can tell you, let me know. I think he came down, looked around, and then I, I, I think he might have said, yeah, you know, we're going to put the decision off for a while. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't speak again. So, you know, and I'm talking many years have gone by since I've seen him, thought of him, you know, interacted with him. Then next thing I know, he posts something. We bought a house. We're moving down. And I was like, oh, cool. Let's get a beer. Let's get reconnected. So with no, and I knew he was a musician in high school. So we went and had a beer, kind of clicked. It was nice to kind of reminisce and, sure. you know, like no time had gone by. I love it. I, I, that's be the with, beauty of old friends, right? Is you just, it, it absolutely was. Yep. And I said, listen, and he's a piano player. And I said, listen, I've got this trio. Come sit in, have a good time. Let's just check it out. If you like it, it, you know, if everybody's happy, let's see what it goes. So he came and sat in. I did not remember him being this wonderful a player. I mean, huh. super great big ears, melodic. It's been a few. It's been a few decades. So yeah, <laughs> it's been a few decades exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so it's kind of turned into a thing. Now he's part of that quartet now. Nice. And that's been fun. And I had a gig, you know, where it was. I was doing it solo. I said, "Hey, can I do it as a duo?" The guy said, "Absolutely." So we did it as as uh, electric piano, piano, and acoustic guitar. And we have like this common music dictionary. You know, he goes off into jazz a little bit, and I go into more harder rock. Sometimes, but in the places where our circles overlap, it was really, really fun. So, you know, we both are big James Taylor fans, Nice, you know, good, just well-written, good pop song fans, that type of thing. And so it was just really nice blending. And it is not lost on me, Dave, that there's this strange, you know, I love playing with a great piano player. Yeah. And I, I was just a little bit exhausted about making the rounds in the new area where I had moved. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a like, open mic or jam guy to go meet musicians. That's not it. I'm definitely, I'm usually skeptical of the amount of effort that going the Craigslist route will take you. Yep. And so, you know, this group is one Craigslist guy, one guy that was a connection of a connection from where we both moved from and, and, you know, an old high school friend and it's really been nice. So it's, it's the music is good. The playing is good. The banter and discussion and camaraderie is really, you know, a very nice thing. The hang, but man. It's, that's it's, it is. It's, that's it's the important how part. the universe will deliver for you. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad to hear. Like that's like congratulations. Yay! I'm I'm happy, man. That's yeah. So shout out to my buddy Brent Lever, super musician, super piano player, and really fun. To, like it's not lost to me. I look over there and someone who I had not seen in years, uh, you know, just kind of falls out of the universe into a, into a musical group I want to play with. So, I, I, really cool. I have often found that to be the case. I, I think I've mentioned, it was, wasn't that long ago where you said, you know, what do you do when you like looking for people to play with or, you know, when the gigs dry up or I, I forget what the context was. And I said, well, I've learned that what I do is I just come and play my drums. And then for whatever reason, that sort of focuses me on finding opportunities to play and, you know, my schedule suddenly fleshes out or, you know, somebody comes out of the woodwork or whatever needs to happen happens. And well, listen to the universe, right? That's it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Seems uh, to work out. I don't know why, but it seems to work out. All right. Hey, uh, this episode is sponsored by Super Mega Ultra Groovy and their app Capo. This is our go-to app for learning music by ear. Listen, here's the deal. We've all done it. You fire up Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube, and you start playing a song that you're trying to learn for a band that you're in or whatever. And it's hard to move around in a way that is functional for us as musicians learning songs. And even on apps like YouTube, where you can slow it down, it doesn't sound so good. And that's being kind. Well, this is why we love Capo, because Capo gives us song-learning superpowers. Capo's transcription playhead gives precise control over playback start point and helps you learn in chunks so you can, like, loop things. Really focus on that solo you need to learn, that vocal line, whatever it is, you can learn it in chunks, which is how we learn best, right? It's the way to do it. And then, to my point before about being able to slow things down— with Capo, when you slow things down, even at like a quarter speed, it still sounds great because Capo was built using high-end studio quality audio stretching technology. This isn't everything Capo does, though. It does a ton more, and it's completely free. 
There's no account signups, no ads, no sneaky free trial subscription to forget about. So you got to check it out. You have nothing to lose. Visit capoapp.com or search for capo, C-A-P-O, in the App Store. It works on Mac, iPhone, iPad. Again, capo by super mega ultra groovy, C-A-P-O-A-P-P.com. And our thanks to capo and super mega ultra groovy for sponsoring this episode. While I got you here, I want to tell you about a show called the What is Music podcast. This is the ultimate question, right? What is Music is a music podcast about music, and they're currently on their fourth season where they are going through Radiohead's entire career, album by album, track by track. I know some of you are going to love this, Russ, especially you. You want to check this out. Every season sees a different artist introduced and explores whether context matters when listening to music, whether knowing the history of an artist affects your appreciation of their output and somehow managing to have fun along the way. So join Adam, Steve, and Lucas, the big mates, on their journey to discover what is music. Find them now on all your podcast platforms. What is music? A music podcast about music. And thanks to Adam, Steve, and Lucas for doing this swap with us. So speaking of listening to the universe, um, I listen to Facebook, which is our, our, our universe most of the time. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> but I saw I, that uh, my friend and our, I, what's that? Sigh. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, sorry. Uh, I saw that our, uh, my friend and our friend, Dave Cook, who was on the show actually right after like June of 2020. So, you know, kind of right as COVID lockdowns were sort of settling in on all of us. Um, and he, Dave, for those of you that listen, if you haven't, I'll put a link in the show notes. Dave runs uh, his own recording studio in upstate New York. I believe he calls it Area 52 Studios. I'm sorry if I get that wrong, Dave, because I'm doing it from memory. Uh, he's the one that that sort of haphazardly mentioned, oh, yeah, I engineered the recording of Love Shack and uh, shared a lot of things with us. He also does some live sound, which he talked about in that interview, too. And I saw that he was mixing monitors for the current Natalie Merchant tour. And I also saw that he was going to be in Portland, Maine last week, which is about an hour from my house. So I texted him and I'm like, well, wait a minute, are you going to be in Portland? Like, are you still on the tour? If you are like, is this finally our opportunity to meet? Dave has been a listener of this podcast for a while. And for even longer than that, much longer than that, a listener of my Mac geek gab podcast. He's written in a bunch and uh, obviously we've gotten to know each other, but we've never met in person. And so last Tuesday, that's what happened. We went down. He not only did he have time to meet with us, but, uh, you know, we were able to see the show and he was able to show us his rig. And it was really there were there were a lot of things I noticed. Uh, the the first thing about his monitor rig is it's not all that different from what a lot of us are doing. Uh, it's a little different from what a lot of us are doing, but not that far removed. He's using a Mackie DL32 for all the inputs on stage. So it's um, this tour. There's a, a quartet, a, a string quartet on stage, plus piano, guitar, drums, bass, and two singers, Natalie and her uh, harmony singer. And the two of them sing like so well together. It's ridiculous. It, they sound like sisters, man. It's so good. Um, and so, you know, they, that, the, the DL32, the, did I say Mackie? I, I didn't mean Mackie. I meant Midas. It's a Midas DL32. Yeah. The Mackie is the Mackie is the DL32S, right? The Midas is the DL32. So they use the Midas DL32. And uh and that is is what the all the inputs are in. And what fascinated me is that's what sets the gains for both the monitors and the mains. They are not using splits. Normally in, in uh, most of the time, even we've talked about it here, even, you know, with, with bands like ours, you might use splits, meaning literally the microphone signal from the stage, you know, is split. One goes to the monitor rig, one goes to the house rig, both can set their own gains and do whatever they want. And nobody messes with the other with this, uh, our friend Dave and his friend, George, who's doing front of house have worked together for many years and, and trust each other. So Dave sits all the gains on stage uh, for the monitors and then just feeds all of that over Dante to the front of house. And it's mixed uh, from front of house out there like that, which that fascinated me that they weren't using splits. And Dave's mixing on a Behringer wing console, uh, which he loves. 
And, mm. it, you know, it, like it, at seeing all this stuff, it's like, this really isn't that much, you know, this is a, obviously a pro tour and they're, you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing. And he, what, keep a simple approach. It's keep it simple. Yeah. He said before the tour, he and George brought all their, they're using their own gear. Uh, they brought all their gear to like Dave's house and updated all the firmware to make sure everything was on the same version of Dante. Cause otherwise, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And they got all that, you know, up to date and, and played with it and figured out the right way to, okay, this is how we're going to do it every night. And okay. Yep, yep. Good to go. And then good to go. And, uh, it's amazing. Everybody's on in ears. And I asked him how that went and he said it, it like some of the people hadn't used, I, I I'm interpreting, he, he didn't necessarily say this, but I, I'm interpreting that it, it, that some of the people in the production are new to ears. Some are not, of course. And he said rehearsals, there was a lot of time in rehearsals, just kind of getting people up to speed with ears. They're all mixing. They all can mix themselves, but that became uh, more of a chore at, to, with, with diminishing returns. And so what Dave did, and I think we can all learn from this is he said, all right, everybody forget your mixes. I'm going to wipe everything clean. I'm going to build a baseline mix that gives you kind of a, you know, a, a mix of everything. And sure. that's in one channel, you know, and then from there you can add all the other stuff. Cause they, they have, you know, individual in like at their stations, everybody can dial in, you know, you want more kick drum, you want more vocal, you want more cello, whatever you're good to go. And so he's like, I'll give you a baseline mix and you can turn that up or down to your discretion and then add from there. And he said that really simplified things and got things uh, to, to where, you know, people were able to be productive. Yeah, that, well, that makes sense because does, most people right? don't know how to mix. Mixing themselves is just going to, you know, I, I, I would be the poster child for that. Like, yes. I don't know how to mix. Right. So I right. would get it. What I think is, cl what I think is close under the circumstance of a sound check and then everything changes, you know, at downbeat and then you're lost and then trying to decipher on the fly in real time what you're not happy with and fixing it while you're trying to play your parts, that's that's a recipe for disaster. It sucks, yeah. And then, because Dave is there only mixing monitors, and man, I said that to Dave that night. I can't believe I did this again. I said, well, I was, it was explaining it exactly this way, and he's like, wow, what do you mean, only mixing monitors? I'm like, no, no, I don't mean to belittle this job. I mean, you don't have to do anything else, so you can really do this, like with full focus and because he is able to focus fully on monitors and not have to worry about front of house or anything. What he does is actively mixes that, uh, that sort of blended mix. So if there's a moment in the show where, you know, maybe the acoustic guitar needs to be brought up a little bit, he'll bring that up and it brings it up for everybody. So they're getting this sort of actively mixed thing or conversely, if the guitar is too loud, he can turn it down. And, uh, you know, it, it, it works, it works well. So everybody's sort of getting the benefits of Dave, sure. Dave doing what he's supposed to do. Right. I mean, obviously. So yeah, it, um, it's fascinating. Fascinating. Um, the other, when you, when you say not a lot different than, than like what, what would be different? Like what would be exotic for a, for a, for a, a monitor mixing setup? Well, I think. Probably most of us are not running Dante at our gigs. Dante is, for lack of a, a more descriptive term, uh, you know, audio over Ethernet, right? And so most of us are probably not running Dante at our gigs, although I know some of us are. But that just uh, means a digital snake? Essentially a digital snake that, that can send the signal in, to many different places, right? So Dave's able to just send the... Um, you know, the, the, all the channels out Dante to the, uh, to the front of house console. And then he plugs in from that. He's got his own mixer out there. He's using a Yamaha mixer and, and he's got a bunch of, uh, universal audio, uh, hardware boxes that he uses for his plugins. And it's, it's great. Right. And the sound was, the sound was pristine in the room. It really, every instrument was able to be heard. It was, it was really, and, and it was fairly quiet. It, it rarely broke 90 dB. It was nowhere near as loud as, uh, the stage yeah. was at my gig on Friday. Funny. Yeah. But, um, the other thing I noticed was that 
of the what eight musicians on stage, I think I'm counting that right. So eight people playing instruments on stage, and there were there were ten musicians, including Natalie and and her uh, backup singer, harmony singer. Uh, but of the people playing instruments, the um, they two of them used iPads, and the remaining six used paper charts. <laughs> And like almost to their detriment, like the, the, the drummer, there were points where he had to literally put down both sticks to do like a triple page turn kind of thing. And it was like, you, you could use an iPad, <laughs> like, dude, yeah. there's a better way, man. Like I wanted to go and tell him like, there's a better way. Um, but it, it, I, I asked Dave about it and he's like, yeah, it's just personal choice of the musicians, you know? Mm. Um, but I, is, I, it, is it reasonable for us to jump into the Jay Segan conversation? Oh, we could. This this is a perfect time to jump into the Jay Segan conversation. Yes, yes, yes. So I up. saw I saw a post from our friend Jay Segan, who has run a bunch of clubs in the San Francisco Bay Area. We played at a bunch of his clubs. We did Cirque du Mac parties at. Uh, I think he I think he was Red Devil Lounge, but he was also like Red Slims Devil. and and a couple others too, right? And now Jay uh, books. He books bands is is sort of a good general term. There are some A-list bands, maybe B-list bands that he books, but he also then is hired to book bands you haven't heard of, like cover bands for events and functions and weddings and corporate parties and things like that. People reach out to him and event planner will reach out and say, I need a band that does, you know, fits this, this description, go find it for me and, uh, you know, send it to my event or whatever. So, let me sh let me shape this for you a little bit more though. Yeah, it's actually go more ahead. than that. So he, he has been a club owner. Mm -hmm. He's been a musician. Mm -hmm. He has a booking agency and he has a very small cadre of very specific corporate cover bands. I mean, he he is about. I mean, he's a super guy. I don't mean this in a facetious way. Sure, he is about you know business models of making money. Yes. and he doesn't just book bands. He actually books tours for bands. Right, like, right. You know, yes, Howard. You know, uh, Thomas Dolby. Um, I know he did um, uh, Duran Duran. I mean, so he, I, I, I don't know if that's called a booking agent or, you know, a tour manager or whatever it is, but he has these, you know, deep relationships with several, you know, big name acts where, you know, he books their, their full tours. So he's an interesting guy. And the context of this, and, and just take it from all that stuff, he's a knowledgeable guy. Yeah, he's a knowledgeable and, guy. But he he's does, a knowledgeable guy. he does work with these event planners who come to him for, I don't oh, know sure. if that, I don't know if he's ever reached out to the house rockers special events, special events where you, you want to cover band that does X, Y, or Z. Right. And he posted something saying, Hey, I've noticed something. And what he noticed is that for several events recently, the planners have asked him, will the band be using iPads on stage? And some of them have even said, I don't want a band using iPads on stage, especially anybody downstage, you know, a singer, somebody playing guitar at the front of the stage. I, I don't want them, you know, I don't, I don't want the iPad there. And I, I found that fast. I found that interesting. This guy who books a lot of stuff, I found it a really interesting data point that he's seeing event planners ask for bands that aren't, you know, d tied to their charts essentially is. I think is, the end of that post was he was like, cover bands lose the iPads. I think yeah, he actually memorized he made the songs. a commentary on it, right? Yeah. 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 And then he made a commentary, but he was like, yeah, it's like, it's time. Now, I haven't seen this with, you know, any of the weddings that like Uptown has been asked to, you know, put in bids for or anything like that. Uh, I don't think you have seen it anywhere, but it's. It's a, I found it really interesting. So I posted it in our, our gig gap group and the discussion there was wonderful. I like really great. Well, it was, it was wonderful, but it was as expected. There was, well, there was pushback, you know, there was, was there was like, so there, there was a little pushback, like, but it was yeah. mostly a productive conversation. If you look at the same post, I made literally the same post in our gig gap group that I made in uh cover band central that immediately devolved into like the worst of humanity. And it was just fascinating <laughs> to watch because everybody was like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This is stupid. Just do whatever you want. It's like, I think you missed the point of what he's, I think, I don't think you read what he said. I think you saw, he said no iPads and it triggered you. And then you just, you know, welcome to social media. Right. Like uh, obviously, but the conversation in our, our gig gab group was actually quite nice. Like people actually read the post and had opinions about it, which was great. But I just find it fascinating, uh, and I think it's good for all of us to know 
that there are at least some event planners out there who are asking for bands that do not rely on charts. Well, even bigger than that. So A, um, yes, Jay posted from a specific data point, like like firsthand knowledge. Mm -hmm. With And his response was not, hey, this is the way it is. This is the modern way. You know, he, he was like, a customer is speaking, you know, there's something to learn here. Yes. And, you know, if you want to play any of these gigs through me, here's what you can expect, right? Yep. And then the next part of this is, you know, and again, as long as we've had a podcast, I, you know, this and Cargo Shorts are the two, <laughs> are the two banes of our existence, right? right but this right. Is, is a little bit more interesting because a person with a very unique and valuable perspective spoke out and right. the responses were... You know, they were largely predictable. And, and again, w- when it devolved in other places was, lo- yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't think we've ever had a conversation on our social channels that has devolved. That, you know, no, we have a, we, you, fo- you folks are, you folks are awesome. Paul. Yeah. yeah Paul and I are the worst yeah. ones there. We're the, we're the a-holes, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you know, we kind of get back to this. You know, it's as old as time, you know, our, our iPads on stage. Okay. And you, you know, we saw like, you know, a fairly busy musician saying, Hey, if I'm a last minute sub in a cover band and we're background stuff and nobody's really looking at us, you know, we're, we're, we're dinner music. I think it's okay. I would never do it. If I was asked to sub in an original band, you know, that's all about the expression of the art. Yeah. So the, yeah. You know, there's this, there was some really interesting perspectives on it. I've shared mine. I don't think there's any value in going back to that part of it. Now, the interesting part of this conversation was that, a person who comes from a unique vantage point, yep, different than than a cover band musician, um, you know, was sharing a piece of data that came right from a client that had a that strong a perspective about it, and there's something to learn there. And those those event planners talk like they go to co- conventions together. They like they, there's definitely an industry of event planners. So, like to me, this was all right. Keep your eyes peeled and be ready because. It wouldn't surprise me if say like it would shock me if for a bitter pill gig, somebody said, are you going to have music stands on stage? Like it's an original band. We present yeah. our own vibe. You get what we deliver and, and pe- that's what people expect. Right. But it, it would not shock me at all. If Uptown, the wedding band, the function band that I play in eventually gets a call from an event planner that says, yeah, I just, you know, w- w- this event, no iPads. You know, can you, can you deliver on that? And I don't think they would spring it on us at the end. I think it would be right where Jay said, like right at the booking, right at the front of it. Like, here's what we want. We want, you know, three hours of music. You got to play dance songs. We need cocktail hour, no iPads during the dance song, you know, just on the list of all the things. And it won't surprise me if that winds up becoming a normal thing. I don't want to say the norm, but, but a thing that you occasionally encounter in the, well, if nothing the else, for those who have taken the position, it doesn't matter. Here's one perspective where mm-hmm. it does matter. Mm-hmm. And I would say this, if you're out trying to get that type of business, you don't be know ready. when it matters. You don't know. Yeah, that's I mean, it. Be ready because it could be the next booking that you get in, includes this this clause. And you might have to turn it down. Like, uh, you know, I, uh, there you go. It's just how it be. Yeah. yeah. Or, or you'll never know why they turned you down. So. Please listen. Um, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Let us know what you think. It, about it, cargo shorts. Uh, about cargo shorts. Yeah. We're, we, <laughs> uh, yeah. Why would they write into about anything else? We haven't talked about anything yeah. else. Just the cargo shorts. <laughs> hey, I want to give you three kind of cool gear gab things. Yeah. Oh, I love gear gab. All right. So one is I just want to, again, shout my love for Bose because I use a Bose L1 Pro 16 for my uh, solo work and for my small combo work. I have loved the sound of it. I've loved the reliability of it. And right now, I just got to say, I love Bose's service. A a unruly patron patron knocked my tower over and the tower got a little wrecked. The, The process by which to give Bose my serial number, it's a, it's a generous warranty you wouldn't think this would be covered, right? Like this is, you know. Mm. Yeah, that's, that. you should have insurance for that, not not Bose's warranty for that. Sure, yeah. Anyway, easy to send in. They tell you when they received it. They tell you when they're working on it. They tell you when they send it out. They tend to tell tell you when it's been delivered to you. No questions asked. This is the second or third time I've done a Bose warranty 
claim over the last 10 years, it has been an absolutely fantastic experience of customer service. So three, three thumbs up for Bose, it would be the first one. The second one, I want to ask you a question. Did you see that Apple has announced that Logic Pro will be fully functional on an iPad very soon. Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. iPads with the, what, A16 chip or some A A15 yeah, chip or, better or something. Relative, but not. Like, you don't need an no. M series for it. They also announced Final Cut Pro is, is coming to the iPad right. as well. That, you do need an M series chip on it. But um, but Logic does not. Yeah. I um, I'm, I haven't messed with it yet, but I'm curious. Well, it's not out yet, right? Right. Well, that's true. I, I mean, I could probably call a friend and get on the press list. But, you know people. Yeah, yeah. We do. We, that's the, the other job. Uh, helps with that sometimes sometimes not by the way anyway my gear Apple gap question thing. is yeah my is right now you essentially use logic running on your mac as the mixing console for this show and, and many other shows right correct i'm doing it right now yeah so here's the question what what is the chain that you would need running logic on an ipad how would you get the output of logic on an ipad i mean because audio is audio hijack the glue technology that patches together the different the different well, applications no, lo- that you use? Logic, so, no. Um, the glue that... Logic is the mixer alone. And then what I use is... Because I have a combination of hardware audio devices, like the one that my mic is plugged into, right? I, it needs to go analog to digital. So there's a yeah. hardware box. That is the, the Personas Quantum 2626. But it doesn't really matter what it is. It's, you know, that's... That's what gets it there. And then there are software devices. For example, the audio from you has to come in. And because Logic only sees one device at a time, it needs to be all aggregated together. This is what I was ranting about a couple of weeks ago. That aggregation is a thing you can do in Apple's software, but they broke it in Ventura. So I have to use Monterey, but that's what I'm doing. And so for the software devices, I use a piece of software called Loopback, which is made from the same people that make uh, Audio Hijack uh, called their company name is Rogue Amoeba and loopback lets you define these software audio devices so that you can take something coming. We use discord as the app uh, as like our, our voice uh, over the internet app. And then I output from discord to a specific device that I created with loopback. And then with Apple's aggregate stuff, I tie that together with my hardware device and that's how it logic sees it. So, I don't think this would be doable on the iPad. All the functionality is technically there because iPad OS and Mac OS are very, very similar at their core, but there is no ability to do that kind of thing. No, on but the my iPad. question is one, one step beyond that out yep. of logic yeah. into Facebook live streaming or something like that. Yeah. So I don't, how do you, yeah, that you, that, I would also use an, uh, a, a virtual audio device for that, right? I would create another device in loopback that would be like the output and uh, the, mm-hmm. you know, the Facebook stream output, if you will. And then I would in the browser well, what's that the equivalent I was, of loop for, for iPad. OS? There isn't, that's what I'm saying is like, you can't touch core audio the same way on an iPad that you can on the Mac. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, now that now that logic is here, we I expect a lot of these solutions are going to start popping up, right? I I would hope that Apple will open that door and let things like you know loop back and and these software devices happen on the iPad. I, but it's Apple, right? So like mm. they 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 move, especially with this kind of stuff. They tend to move slowly, and it's because they want the user experience to be great. And their definition of great is without hiccups and their definition of great very specifically does not include without limitations. They are happy Mm -hmm. to, especially on, you know, version one, they're happy to leave lots of limitations in place so that the few things that you can do work really well. And then they wait and see, okay, let's fix those things. Let's, you know, if there's any hiccups with that, great. Okay. Smooth that out. Now, what are people clamoring for? What are the things that we could add to make this better? And then they will slowly add things. So I think we're years away from loop back for iPad, if ever, but certainly not months. It would be years. Uh, uh, based on, yeah, this is based on some guy in a room that smells like man in Durham, New Hampshire. So, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like, I don't know. Love it. <laughs> All right. My last gear gap thing is when we started this episode, 
talking about how the how the universe likes to deliver. Yeah. So last episode, I was telling you about this mic that I had heard about by Mojave Audio, called yeah. MAD, which is a dynamic mic, a dynamic handheld mic. And it was fascinating to me because I recorded an EP several years ago, and the studio I recorded and used Mojave fantastic sounding studio mics. Sure. And I saw that this mic had come out and it's at a $159 price point. And I was like, that is so fascinating to me that this company that so uh, effectively plays in the higher end of studio audio is coming out with, you know, basically a, a 58 competitor, right? Right, right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, we talked about it last week and um, you were nice enough to tag it in the, in the minutes and like the universe, this really nice lady named Ashley reached out and said, Hey, I heard you want to try one of our mics. Let me send you one. And she did. And I used it for the first time last week. And, you know, we, we, you and I get stuff in this manner occasionally over time. Not always. No. Rarely do we, well, you know, usually if something isn't good, we just won't talk about it. Right. That's... So if it makes it to the show, you know, we're not here to, you know, rip things up or anything like that. But if something is cool, we want people to know about it. And so that's what Gear Gab is, right? That's what Gear Gab is. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I use this MAD, Mojave MAD, at a solo acoustic gig. And I was, really not pleasantly surprised because again, I knew Mojave quality, but I was just kind of amazed at this price point, how rich and warm sounding that, you know, the, the construction of the mic is like second to none and just a really nice piece of hardware. And the sound was, you know, Mojave rich. I, you know, I don't know how to break things down into like response patterns or anything like that, but just, it was a great, great sounding mic. And Interesting. You know, yeah, super, 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 super huh. clear, super rich. I might, really, I, I really might have to find lows. I might have to grab one of those and put it up against, like, you know, the 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 fifty eight and the PR twenty and the things in that price range, and really yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. And like I said, the reason it just kind of struck me is that I was, you know, you know, Neumann has a handheld mic and it's really expensive, right? Yeah, a right. dynamic handheld mic. So a lot of the you know mic vendors that play in this area. They separate themselves by price point as well, but Mojave went right to a sweet spot of price point. Yeah, and the mic absolutely over delivers what I expected it, and it's really super. Huh. All right. Yep. All right. I love it. Thank you for checking it out. That's that's uh, that's yeah, great. You should check it out. I'd love to hear what you think about yeah, it as well. I will. I will. I'll, yeah, I'll let them know we talked about it here and and um, and check one out for sure. Yeah, you can you can kind of do the technical scrub on it. Yeah, I can do the. Ooh, it makes me sound good. It makes well, me that, feel but good. that's the most important part, right? Like, <laughs> like we can get nerdy about it and nerdy is good, but yeah. like, like the nerdy stuff only matters. Like it, it, it's sec it's secondary to, do I like it? Does it work for me? Does it like, am I comfortable using it? Like all of those things, right? That's, that's the important part. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah I'm glad to hear it. And, yeah, and the mic was designed by, you know, this Grammy-winning technical guy, David Royer, who I'm guessing is the Royer ribbon mic guy, which is a, a real big deal. Oh, you know, I bet you are right. Yes, that sure enough. Yeah, yeah, that is that is the same Royer of Royer Labs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Nice catch, man. I, I missed you that entirely. Uh, this is, I'm here for you, buddy. This is why we're, we're here for each other. This is why we do what That's we do. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. You got anything else, man? This has nope, been action packed. Week. Look at us go. We this covered some ground. ground. We did. We did. All right. Cool. Oh, oh, and then I bumped into my microphone. Man, I rarely do that. <laughs> that's, that's, oh. okay. All right. Well, you know, that's, if, if there was ever a sign, that's the sign. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Send in your thoughts about iPads and cargo shorts and what the universe has told you, right? What else do we say? More interesting than that. Yeah, always be performing. That's the one. <laughs>